experience and a work in the Royal Shakespeare Company in a specialist role within the sales and marketing team, which we call Audience Insight. It's my responsibility to glean as much insight as possible from vast and varied sources of data and communicate this to the relevant teams. One key component of what I do is the implementation and use of customer surveys to collect the data which informs our decisions. I feel that survey is often overlooked as a source of insight, possibly due to a lack of skills in the area. Understanding our customers plays a vital role in planning for the future and I'm passionate about the use of surveys to provide a solid foundation for these plans. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to unlock insight using customer surveys. Insight is one of those buzzwords we hear banded around and may use, but don't stop to think what it actually means. There are a few different definitions of insight, but one stuck in my mind. Insight is information that informs decisions. In any organisation, it's vital to make informed decisions, and especially in the non-profit sector where resources are scarce. Information can come in many different forms. Thinking about those people who are the lifeblood in our organisations... That's to say, ticket buyers, members, donors, and, of course, all of us who work within the organisation. That information could be in form of data on what they do, so their behaviour, but also what they think, so their opinion. We have various tools at our disposal to find out about the behaviour and opinions of ticket buyers, members and donors. The biggest is, of course, our CRM system. In our case, this is Tessitura, which contains huge amounts of information on behaviour. Indeed, Tessitura also contains some customer opinion in the form of customer service issues. However, there are other sources of information on customer behaviour. For example, Google Analytics tells us about online behaviour. We also have a visitor counting programme because our Stratford home is also a visitor attraction with non-ticketed elements such as free exhibitions. Using this information in conjunction with the great analytical tools in Tessitura helps us to build a comprehensive picture of what people are doing. When it comes to why people are acting the way they do, their opinion of the experience, what they like or don't like, we have a different set of tools. Remember, a show might be a sellout and yet fail to deliver a great experience. Based on the ticket sales alone, it looks like a huge success. Vice versa, it might not sell well, but audiences love it. There are a whole host of questions we might want to ask, including some about who the person actually is demographically which we can't find out accurately without asking them in a survey. Surveys aren't the only tool in our toolbox. We all receive loads of feedback on social media, by emails, letters, phone calls, or by talking to people face to face. But whilst this gives us some very rich and useful data, we must bear in mind the inherent skew in the feedback. Those who take the time to spontaneously provide feedback tend to be at either extreme of the opinion scale, either a huge fan or someone who had a particularly bad experience. We did a test of this when we first reopened our Stratford Theatre buildings after a huge redevelopment. We provided feedback cards around the building for people to complete, as well as sending out an online survey to a randomly selected sample of people who I know had been in the building. Both contained the exact same rating scale. The card ratings had disproportionately more responses at each end of the scale, compared with the more moderate online survey results, which gave a more balanced view. This wasn't just the case for cards. We ran a month's trial of feedback kiosks and saw the same effect as the cards, with more strongly positive and negative ratings for the kiosks compared with selecting a sample of people and actually asking them for their opinion. I'm guessing many of you are now sitting back and thinking, that's fine, we have a survey, I don't have to do anything. But if you're watching this, you probably guessed you could be doing more. Arts and cultural organisations are often short on both time and resource but it's worth investing the time in a good programme of surveys in order to better inform those all-important decisions. Perhaps you send out a standard survey to all ticket bookers after they've attended. Brilliant. You've got lots of tracking data. But do you always use all of it? Could some questions be removed to make way for new questions? How long is it? What kind of response rate do you get? If it's really short, that's great for the audience member. But are you really answering all those questions people in your organisation need to know? If it's really lengthy... Could you split it out and ask some people certain questions and others a different set of questions and, in fact, have two surveys? Do you have a specific survey for your members or subscribers? And what about another for your donors, which ask more specifically about their experience? And what about people who've left the programmes about why they left? Have you ever asked those who had attended a past season yet didn't attend a similar season of work why they didn't come? Have you thought about a survey of those in your local area who don't attend at all? What's stopping them? There are so many things you could do with surveys, if you don't already, which might seem a little overwhelming. 
Our approach is to break down our surveys by the different groups of people who interact with us in some way. We have our regular audience and visitor surveys, which we review each season. There is a set of core questions and others which are changed each time, generally on a topic basis. For example, we might ask details of the technologies our audiences use one season, and then their opinions of recent marketing images the next. There are also those hot topics knocking around which get a question or two. It was from these surveys we learned some useful facts about our trailers and behind the scenes videos. For example, trailers tend to be more appealing to our newer or less familiar audiences and are used during the decision to book. Whereas behind the scenes videos are more popular amongst our regular audiences and those who have already booked, but help them to engage more deeply with our work. All types of video material particularly appeal to younger and more diverse audiences. This may seem obvious, but knowing it, we can tailor the different video material to the different audiences far better than just guessing what is appealing to whom. This is information that can inform our decisions. Indeed, we decided as a result to redirect some of our marketing spend into getting the trailer for our family Christmas show into regional cinemas last year. This year, we did our first television advertising. Our confidence was well placed and we saw our ticket sales increase as a result, particularly amongst new audiences. Every year we pick one big topic for a survey, which might kick off a review of that area. For example, this year we chose to survey all of our membership, both online and in our members' newsletter. It was the first time one of my surveys had made front page news. It had an amazing response, even amongst lapsed and prospective members. The membership team, drawn from across marketing, box office and development, came together to hear the results and held a brainstorming session on how we could use the findings to revamp the programme. The team will be feeding back to members in the next issue of Members News, which not only gives them a chance to tell people about the changes to the programme, but also highlights some of the benefits that people didn't know about. Once again, we can see how this is insight, information that informs decisions. One example of what we learned was that only a few members were aware of the free ticket exchange, even though it seemed to be a valuable benefit. We also learned that the main reason some members lapsed was that they didn't want to commit to booking tickets so far in advance, in case their plans changed. Combining these two facts, we think reassuring members that they can exchange their tickets with no fees could help keep people in the membership programme. As you can see from the diagram, we also use surveys to assess our work with teachers and young people. For example, our first encounter Shakespeare productions, which tour to schools and local venues. As we don't receive data on who has attended, we go back to the old-fashioned pen and paper surveys with reply-paid envelopes. For the public evening performances held in schools, the students help to hand them out. The results show how worthwhile this kind of touring is, both with schools and venue audiences often being new to the RSC's work, to Shakespeare, or indeed new to live theatre. They also tend to be from more diverse social and ethnic backgrounds than many theatre-goers. And as the prime purpose of this kind of touring is not to generate income, it's this information which helps to show the value of conducting these tours beyond financial gain. It's our responsibility as part publicly funded organisation, as well as our passion, to introduce new and younger audiences to Shakespeare in an appropriate way. Once again, it's this information which informs our decisions and future planning. Recently, we've started broadcasting some of our productions to cinemas around the world, as well as then webcasting the same productions into schools. As you may have guessed, this new development followed research amongst our audiences, showing a strong interest in the idea. In this case, our insight led to a decision, which in turn led to a need for more information to inform more decisions. Our first broadcast of Richard II contained an announcement about an online survey. UK cinemas also distributed shortened paper versions of the same survey. We certainly weren't short on replies, as you can see from the sackful brought to us by the RSC's version of Santa just before Christmas. The results were fascinating. The experience at the cinema was rated equally excellently to that at the theatre, both being extremely high. I had to triple check the data to convince myself it wasn't a mistake as the ratings were so closely aligned with very big sample sizes. The details reveal a different kind of experience, however. Most people agreed that nothing could quite replicate the feeling of being there and the thrill of the live experience. But yet, the filmed version, with its amazing close-ups, made some of the Shakespearean language more accessible for people as they subconsciously lip-read along. It was also more accessible to people in a different kind of way. 
there were a greater proportion of people attending the cinema who had some form of disability. We received comments from them about how they wouldn't have otherwise been able to see an RSC production. So hopefully now you have loads of ideas about how you could extend your programme of surveys to collect more data to inform your decisions. But my advice would be to take one step at a time because there's no point in collecting lots of information if you're not going to take the time to do something with it. Properly analysing all the data to find the insight takes almost as much time as collecting it in the first place, and this is often the bit that gets squeezed as we're under pressure to provide the information quickly. Sometimes the answer is really simple. If people are overwhelmingly positive or negative about something, then it gives you a clear answer that can be quickly communicated. But often, the answer lies in that grey area with a mix of people in favour and the people against a new idea. Maybe a majority of people gave something a 6 out of 10. It helps at this point to have a comparison to something else, similar, either in the past or in the present. Here are some of my tips for how to deal with the data you get back from a survey. Firstly, put some time in your diary and turn off email and other distractions. Then prepare by seeing what other data you already have or what results you might compare the answers with. It might help to have a think before you even look at the results and ask yourself what percentage you might expect to answer a key question in a particular way. Often it's easier to read numbers in a graphical form. I'm a big fan of the stacked bar chart. It allows you to see the full spread of results rather than just some kind of average number. Looking at the example I showed from our cinema broadcast, you can see that 75% of the audience rated this production as excellent, and that there's no difference in the ratings by audiences at the cinema and live audiences at the theatre. Well, I also happen to know that our usual production ratings vary around the 50% excellent mark. And indeed, 50% excellent is the target we set for all our work. So this rating of 75% excellent is pretty outstanding. And when I show the ch chart, I might add this. I like this target as it pushes us to be better than just good and stops us from resting on our laurels at a high percentage you rate our work as good, very good or excellent. Be ruthless with what information you show and don't go into chart overload as perhaps the words might have greater impact without lots of numbers to look at. The main thing when looking through lots of data at once is to keep all of the separate bits of information in your head which can add up to tell you the story. I scribble down all of the interesting and surprising statistics on a bit of paper. I then look through them whilst trying to bear in mind what my internal audience from the report or presentation would like to know and what facts or figures would inform a decision they have to make. It's not a simple thing to do. You have to be able to look at the detail whilst bearing in mind the big picture. Sometimes you don't see things at the time, but do later, when you leave the data to one side and do something else. I often see things more clearly when I'm out for a run. Often there's what I call a light bulb moment. This is when you can see how all the data fits together to tell you the answer to the tricky question, or at least how you can best illuminate the data so that it makes sense to your audience of decision makers. Stepping back even further, it's worth taking the time once every year to look at the data you have from all of your different sources, surveys, tessitura, web stats, social media, and setting out to look at the longer term progress of your organisation. This might uncover some big insights that help those at the very top of your organisation to make the best possible decisions going forward. Even if it takes time to expand the insight capability within your organisation, I hope you can see how it is worth focusing on this area so that you can continually grow and learn then the world is your oyster. As I work at the Royal Shakespeare Company, it seems apt I should end on some words from the great playwright. Thank you. <laughs>